and adjunct professor in our School of Criminal Justice, Marlon Lynch. Marlon? Thank you, President Woodrow. Good morning. Um, I'd like to start with some thanks to outreach by our colleagues, our local partners, but also some well-established associations, the uh, Michigan Association of Chiefs of Police, the International Chiefs of Police, the International Association of Campus Law Enforcement Administrators, and Commission Agency on Law Enforcement Accreditation. We have all received your support, prayers, and thanks, and um, very well done. So thank you for that. In addition to that, I've started to focus on some positive things, some positive things that have been shared with me over the past couple of days with that. And helping us in our response to this critical incident, we have approximately 19 law enforcement agencies and six fire departments, numerous emergency medical services as well respond to that. We had all duty police officers, not only from our police department, but from local and partnering agencies that responded, that came without any request to help during that particular situation. Not a surprise though. What occurred on Monday night as far as our response is a collaborative effort and is the product of constant and continuous training together, relationships, and preparation for that. We also, unfortunately, had an opportunity to respond last week to open this high school with a very similar result. The difference is that was not confirmed and it was supposed to be false. So just imagine the stress put on the first responders responding to a situation at open this high school that we take very seriously until otherwise notified. And then just a few days later, responding to this incident We have to recover too. We have to heal. That process has begun as well. We've made services available for our staff, our police and public safety staff beginning today. We also have short-term plans as well as long-term plans as we move forward with this. And we are definitely consulting those that have been through this process before for that particular reason. Learned a few amazing things. And again, not surprising, just knowing what has occurred and who's involved. Our students that were in Berkey Hall, in addition to being placed in situations that they probably have never been encountered with before, when their students and their friends and classmates needed assistance, they were their aid. They took the time to render their aid with them. The officers that responded in the buildings within minutes, one of the first things they encountered were the victims. And those victims happened to be our students. And they stopped to render aid and immediately got emergency medical services on scene to remove them so that they could get the treatment and the care that they needed. Those are significant because they gave them a chance, those that had been wounded. And they're still fighting. But based on, based on those being present at the time, stopping to actually render aid to them. The dispatchers. Dispatch function is a very key component to what we do, our response. And if any of you have heard any of the radio traffic that happened that night, it's amazing. They were calm. They prioritized, they communicated well, they did their job. They did their job extremely well, extremely well. My point in this is to say that it's not based on an individual. We all have roles. When it comes time to actually do what you've been trained to do, that happens. And there's a caring component as well some very selfless and stopping to assist when they could have easily just run out of the building themselves 
And there was nothing wrong with that at all. That's part of how they're actually trained. Our students, they receive, they have that opportunity to receive that training and run high flight. And unfortunately, some of them during their high school years, middle school years, think about the generation that's here now. They've had to go through that. They've had to go through that. So I found that positive to be able to communicate that with that. Those are some stories that need to be discussed as well. And then hopefully that is actually what, what takes place, which some has already done that. But I think we needed to take a moment to actually state that, the appreciation for that. So what we will hear now will be updates. Um, in addition to the Michigan State University Police and Public Safety uh, representative that's here, uh, we will also have Lansing Police Department, Michigan State Police, as well as the FBI come with updates. And again, we appreciate your presence here with that. Deputy Chief Ross. <coughs> Thank you, Chief. Uh, I, I want to begin by, uh, again, honoring the, the, the victims, our students. Um, as a father, I cannot imagine what all the families continue to go through. The past few days have been so unbelievably difficult for our officers and our communities. And we continue to mourn with our community. and. Um, start the healing process. The vigil last night was unbelievable, the, the turnout. Uh, we want to thank our Michigan State Police partners for providing security at that event so our MSU police officers uh, could attend um, and be with our community and mourn together. And that event truly was um, uh, unbelievable how many people came from all over the country I'm going to start with some brief updates, and then I'm going to hand it off to some of our law enforcement partners that are here today to, act, to offer additional details. We've received questions about the ages of the deceased students, and those are as follows. Ariel Anderson was 19 years old. Brian Frazier was 20 years old, and Alexandria Werner was also 20 years old. We were present yesterday when they were recognized in the chamber of the Michigan House of Representatives, and that was a very moving experience as well. As the president mentioned, the five students in the hospital remain in critical condition. Out of respect for the families, we will not be releasing the names of the victims in the hospital. We do understand that some of those names have been made public by family and friends, but we feel strongly about not confirming their names out of respect for the families, and uh, we hope you understand. So even though MSU Police and Public Safety is the lead agency, in charge of this investigation. The investigation is very complex. It's bifurcated and involves many different agencies. Different parts of that investigation are being handled by different agencies in a very unified and coordinated effort. The uni the, that unified cooperation between all of the agencies involved and the resources that have been deployed to campus from all over the country, it is impressive. I'll share a few brief updates regarding the investigation, and some of our partners that are here today will elaborate on some of these details as well. We can confirm that the shooter had two handguns on his person, when he was located. Those handguns are both nine millimeter. He also had additional magazines and ammunition on his person. 
Our investigative team did work with our federal ATF partners to trace those weapons. And we have learned that they were purchased legally by the shooter, but they were not registered. We can also confirm that a note was found on the shooter. And the location that the shooter was located was roughly 3.8 miles northwest of campus. As I said, the Michigan State Police is here today and they will share additional information about that shooting scene. We want to thank all of our local, county, state, and federal partners for all of their assistance that they've provided throughout this investigation. The investigative assistance that we've received after the initial incident has been absolutely overwhelming as well. As the interim president said, we'd also like to thank the media for being active partners throughout this investigation. Your ability to share our information while understanding the sensitive nature and having compassion for the families is very much appreciated. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Lieutenant Renee Gonzalez from the Michigan State Police. We will be available for questions at the end. Chief Information I'm going to give out is uh, dealing with the uh, contact that LPD had, LPD, M LPD, MSU, I'm sorry, LPD, MSP, and our state security officers had contact with the shooter at uh, Lake Lansing and Large Road. Um, the, uh, our detectives responded to Lake Lansing Road and Large Street uh, where a subject matching the MSU's shooting suspect, Anthony McCray, was observed walking. Um, what had happened is the LPD officers received a call that uh, subject matching that description was walking down the street. This was on Lake Lansing Road near Large Street, City of Lansing. Uh, officers made contact, two LPD officers made contact with the uh, shooter. Uh, approximately 20 feet from the grave. Uh, they exited their vehicle, ordered him to put his show his hands. Uh, however, he produced a weapon and then uh, killed himself. It does appear that from uh, the body worn camera that uh, McRae did not verbalize anything to the officers prior to him shooting himself uh, or taking his own life. Uh, once the, uh, they had waited for two additional state security officers to arrive on scene, they walked up to the shooter who was laying on the ground, cleared the scene for their safety, and then started life-saving uh, efforts on him. However, uh, he was declared deceased at the scene. After that, two other state troopers also showed up on scene. Our detectives arrived on scene. They conducted interviews uh, with the officers on scene, photographed the area, downloaded body-worn cameras, in-car videos, and did round counts for all the officers to ensure that no, no rounds were fired. On scene again were two troopers, two capital security officers, two Lansing Township PD officers, and also uh, two LPD officers. A search was done after the scene was secure of McRae's residence with a search warrant that was authored by MSU PD along with LPD. Uh, at the residence, a cell phone was collected, <coughs> journals of sorts, miscellaneous writings, and fired nine millimeter casings. McRae's father was also interviewed at unseen by the MSP detectives at the Lansing Operations Building. Once the search of the residence was completed, detectives began a surveillance canvas to attempt to uh, track the shooters uh, once he cleared the uh, MSU campus until they made contact with the uh, with the LPD officers. They were able to track his uh, his his journey from the MSU campus to where he was made contact. Uh, they are conducting additional surveillance uh, canvases to see if we can find anything else on where he might have been. Detectives are also assisting with downloading information from the Gray's phone, following up on uh, CADA as uh, two additional uh, bus tickets were found in his possession. Found on the Gray were two handguns, 
the one he shot himself with and another in his backpack that he was carrying. He also had a loaded uh, magazine that was full to capacity in his left breast pocket. Uh, in the backpack, he had eight loaded magazines of nine millimeter ammunition, along with a pencil-sized pouch containing 50 rounds of loose nine millimeter ammunition. He also had two empty magazines on his person as well. Two pages of notes were found in his wallet, which was on his person as well. Those are the, uh, that was the note that indicated uh, where he was gonna visit and also kind of gave an indication of why he may be a motive, but nothing that we can actually confirm just yet. Uh, the investigation is ongoing, and at this time, uh, we believe that there were no other sub subjects involved, and that Cray was the lone shooter in this incident. And I'll turn it over to Chief Sosby. Thank you, Lieutenant. Good morning, everybody. My name is Elder Sullivan, the Chief of Police in Lansing. I want to start by saying that the Lansing Police Department, through Mayor Shore's office, is assisting in this investigation uh, as much as, as possible to make sure that we have complete closure in this incident. I want to start by giving my condolences to the family of the victims of this tragic incident. Being a father of a son who was recently accepted to this great university, uh, I can't even imagine the pain that the, the families are feeling right now. I want to thank the officers who responded without pause to this critical incident. Many of those, as has been mentioned before, were off duty and dropped everything they were doing to come assist to make sure that there were no more losses of life and to prevent this tragedy from getting any larger. I want to thank the citizens who, along with the media's help, saw something and said something. Without them, we may not be in this position here today. I'd like to clear up just a few things, a few topics of misinformation that we have uh, been asked about, about either the accused McRae or the address, the Lansing address on Howe Street in the city of Lansing. LPD has not responded to any welfare checks for Anthony McRae. There was a welfare check at the address on Howe Street on February 5th that was not related to the accused. And LPD has not been called in any way to any shots fired at this address. The call history for the accused in this situation is very limited, but I will share this with you now to hopefully avoid any questions in the future. Starting back in 2005, McCray was contacted for a larceny complaint by the Lansing Police Department. 2006, a traffic violation. 2007, a traffic violation. 2007 again, another traffic violation. And in 2019, he was arrested by the Lansing Police Department for a CCW, which is a carrying concealed weapon, which he was arrested for. And for that case, that weapon is still in Lansing Police Department custody. As the lieutenant shared, two Lansing police officers made contact with the accused in the approximately 800 block of Lake Lansing Road. The accused was contacted, he produced a handgun, and ended his own life. You cannot commend the officers enough for their actions, and um, I have really open for questions here at the end, but for now I'm going to turn it over to the FBI Special Agent in Charge, James Ross. Morning. I will start off uh, by thanking the press as well. Over the last few days, I've gotten to know uh, quite a few of you as we just talk offline and, and actually socialize uh, while this, this event continues. So, Paul, you thank you. You've been very supportive, and I uh, appreciate that to, to our folks. <clears throat> so today at Berkeley Hall, we'll, uh, we'll continue meeting with students and staff to return their personal items that were left behind. So that process essentially uh, will begin at 10 and the students can show up. They will meet with uh, our victim specialists and agents. And um, not only will they be able to get their items back, they will uh, they'll be able to meet with our victim specialists for mental health support. Uh, not just FBI, and we've flown victim specialists in from around the country. Uh, MSU has provided victim services as well. Victim specialists are there to meet with the students. 
U.S. Attorney's Office, Western District of Michigan is represented. HSI is also uh, represented. So we have a great cadre of uh, mental health professionals there to support the students. Uh, we did the same at Union yesterday. I would consider it a success in that the students did want to sit with our folks and talk. Um, along those lines, I want to thank the community, especially those who brought comfort dogs yesterday. It went a long way. It meant a lot to uh, students and our folks as well. The comfort dogs, uh, they bring a lot. So thank you to everybody that took the time to do that. Uh, the property that will return to them, essentially, it's a pretty easy process. They'll identify what's theirs. We'll return it. For this, those students that don't want to be there, don't want to go in that building, that's fine. Just understand, you don't have to do that. We will get your property to you. You can come, not go in the building, talk to our folks, and they'll get it to you. Or after today, everything that's left over, everything that remains that hasn't been uh, collected, will be turned over to MSU Police Department so they can uh, coordinate and facilitate getting those items back to you. I have to say about 80% of the students and staff's items were returned. We left, I believe, the numbers about 18 uh, students that did not pick up their things for certain reasons, whether they couldn't make it or just didn't want to. We have those items today at Berkey. So for those students, if they made the essay, they go to Berkey. And again, after today, they can reach out directly to MSU as we start to uh, start to wrap up. Uh, again, the community outpouring has been amazing um, through food and just thank yous and handshakes. and. Um, that's very, very much appreciated. It goes, it goes a long way with, with all our folks and the whole community. I do want to thank uh, Governor Whitmer, Congresswoman Slotkin for their ongoing support. They've been, uh, they've been obviously extremely supportive. They're here at the press conference the other day. And uh, the Congresswoman is, I believe, going to do a site visit today to be with our folks and the students as well. So we uh, look forward to hosting her. Even after today, the FBI will continue supporting the families of Alex, Ariel, and Brian. It doesn't stop today. Those services we provide, the support we provide will continue. Uh, we've met with those families and we've began to build a relationship with them. So we will be there for them along with all our partners. Uh, they have our full support. For the students that remain in the hospital, same thing, they will have the full support of all the FBI and uh, all the partners here. I just wanted to mention that the number for the United Way for additional mental health support for anybody listening that would uh, like to utilize that, 211. You dial 211, you can get support. So that's a, just another outlet. There's a lot of resources, so please, for, for everybody, the students, faculty, the community, um, there's, there's plenty of resources to help you and help the community recover. So with that, Dr. I'll turn it over to you. Good morning. My name is Dr. Rina Bowser. I'm the chair at MSU, the board of trustees. And I come to you today as both the chair and the mother of a Spartan who was on campus the day that the shooter came and took so much from us, but also took our sense of safety. I have this dual role as I'm going through this with the Spartan community, and it's a um, it's an activity that um, allows me to see a lot of empathy um, in people and a lot of grace. And I'm so grateful to the community who has been uh, supportive in ways that we just couldn't imagine. That evening, my daughter called and uh, she she joked as if this later today, she said, oh, this, that's the first time you ever answered my call that fast. Generally, she calls for money. so. <laughs> she might not get me on the first ring, but I, I, I went right away. She said that's when I knew it was real. She sheltered in place in a bathroom for three hours waiting for this to end. And as I'm taking the updates from campus, I'm also feeling her calls, my family's calls, who are all trying to figure out is she okay? Am I okay? Is everyone okay? I want to commend. I would commend Chief Lynch. You have organized and coordinated services in ways that um, I, I didn't imagine. All these folks coming together 
to make sure that our Spartan community feels safe and has been enlightening in so many ways, but also just reassuring. Um, even last night at the vigil, my daughter had not been on campus since Monday, but I convinced her to come. Immediately when I got on um, the stairs, she started just texting me. Mom, I will say, I want you to get back home. There are people who are kneeling. I'm not sure what's happening. And so I texted her um, to get to the chief. You know him, get next to him, you'll be safe. I know people took exception to that text. I, I don't know what you would have done if that was your daughter. I want us to give the grace that's necessary. We all are going to be healing in different ways, in different paces. I'm one of those mothers who's like, tough it up, you know, you, can, you, you scrape your knee, you want peroxide or alcohol. Like, I'm one of those moms, right? Um, but I'm giving my daughter, who is a kind, low-key, cool kid, a lot of grace. And I want that grace extended to all students, all staff, and all faculty. The board has gone to talk with um, Ariel's parents, Alexandra's parents, Brian's parents. Heart-wrenching discussions. Our hearts go out to them. We have offered all our services to them. We also went to Spiro to meet with the families whose children are fighting for their lives right now today. And it was amazing how gracious they were. They're asking how we're doing. I mean, just the Spiro community has been um, absolutely amazing. That was the quote from one of the fathers. Um, and so I, I'm grateful to them for their uh, service to these, these families. This is a hard time, a tough time, but we're gonna get through it. In the coming days, the board will continue to meet with the administration. We'll continue to get updates from Chief Lynch around what has happened, debriefing what we know to be true, what could be different um, going forward. And we also are meeting with faculty, staff, and students around their issues of, of safety and where they felt the safest and why and how we can, we can recreate those kinds of places all around campus. The board is committed to making sure that we are united on the other end of this and that Spartans from all over the globe can come to this campus and feel like they will be safe. We will not have our safety and security stolen by the man of the gun and the sense of violence. It will not happen. I will open it up to questions and turn it right over. Okay, I tell you what, before we open it up for questions, I do just want to highlight that you know, again, this investigation that's ongoing is so massively complex that you may have questions that we know the answer to. The folks up here uh, today just might not have that information. So please be patient with us. We will do our best to uh, answer all of your questions. We remain committed to being transparent and sharing as much information from the very beginning. And that remains, please understand that as we move forward, there's so many questions that you have, we, we may have to, to get that answer and get back to you. So with that, I'll, I'll open it up to questions for any of the speakers that are here today. Or in the back, go ahead. Good morning. Thank you for sharing these updates with us. Adrian Broaddus from CNN, also a 2006 graduate. First question, what's on your heart today? We are a resolute community. What's on my heart is what is my task that I accepted almost two years ago to return to my alma mater. To, and I question what attracts me besides my love for initiative. I know why I'm here today. I know why I'm here today. To help. To help be a part of what we have in existence here as a community and what we have in our partnerships. These relationships are not new. These have been in place for years. And the amazing thing is that 
I'm, I'm in the law. Chris is in the law. Eloise is in the law. The sheriff's in the law. The chief of Meridian Township is in the law. We could go on and on with that. We are truly invested in what we have here. And we're gonna keep it. But it opens discussions for how we proceed and how we create that environment. It's just not up to us. We're gonna have discussions with our community. And this is a societal challenge as well. And real quickly, if you're able to share some of the businesses, for example, the church, the warehouse that was listed in the snow, did he have ties to the places that were named in the note? Reference the note with the listing of the businesses. Um, through our investigation, we found that he had had contact with some of those places. Um, I think he was an employee of the Meyer Warehouse at one time. Uh, and a couple of the other businesses, it appears that he had some issue with the employees there where he was asked to leave. Um, so it looks like he possibly, a motive for that was he just felt slighted. And that's kind of what the note indicated. Um, the, the surveillance image obviously proved pretty important for capturing this particular location. Um, but why did it take three hours to get that out? Like, what, do you have real time monitoring of cameras on campus? What was the process of actually going through that? Yeah, that, that's a good question. You know, we have thousands of cameras on this campus. Um, we, we've worked uh, recently to enhance that even further. Um, there, that system is, is complex. Um, and our investigators immediately began reviewing surveillance footage. Um, it did take them a little bit of time to locate that um, due to the number and the volume of cameras that we have. Uh, and we didn't know what his path was at that point. We didn't know which door he exited. We didn't know which route he took. Uh, we didn't know where he went after he left those buildings. Uh, when our officers arrived on scene at both of those locations, he had already left the building. Uh, we didn't know by, by which direction, which door, and so we immediately began reviewing uh, surveillance footage. As soon as we captured, as soon as we located that image, we immediately pushed it out, uh, immediately pushed it out on social media. Um, my understanding is that the caller actually saw it on one of the news stations, and so we've already said this, but we can't thank our partners enough for, for amplifying that. Uh, and then 17 minutes later, we received a phone call through our dispatch center that he, uh, he had seen. So while I know the timing, um, they, you know, may question the timing, this was an ongoing complex incident. Um, and it, it took a little bit of time to, to find that image, but uh, we, we worked valiantly, and I commend our investigators uh, that set their rifles down and turned around and, and started looking at that video on the, on the computer um, to, to locate those, those images. Do you have real-time capability right now? Yeah, I'll, I'll let the yeah. Chief. So that's um, part of our overall strategic plan is to, we are currently in the process of centralizing all security systems um, that will accompany or will come with real-time monitoring, which is what you're speaking of, is when uh, an example would be in a situation like that, the location would be identified, uh, the operator would know that that particular location has X number of cameras and again automatically pulling the camera off to help with the overall for that. That's something that's in development. That was an initiative that we announced in the fall with that, and that's currently underway. I want to go back to the state police on the, uh, the letter. We may, uh, a couple things. I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. We confirmed that the letter said, hi, my name is Anthony McRae, and the letter said, I will be shooting on them this year. Can you confirm that? That I can't confirm. I have only gotten some information from the letter. I have not read the letter, so I'm not sure exactly what that says. So I, I can't confirm or deny that that was on there. So businesses were threatened, uh, a church was threatened, and then a school district in New Jersey as well, correct? That's that's true. You mentioned the connections potentially between the businesses, and, and uh, can you say anything about a connection to the church and also what the connection to the school district in New Jersey was? I know they talked about having been uh, part of that community, but specifically the school district. The school district can't come on, comment on why he was threatening that specific school district. We just know that he did have some connections to New Jersey, but that was years ago. So we don't, I'm not sure why he was bringing that up so late in the game. And the church. 
the church, I had no information on that as well. Okay, and then he also in his letter correct me if I'm wrong, uh, claimed to be the leader of 20 killers, is that right? That's true, yes. Can you give us a sense of how you were able to uh, invalidate that claim if, if you have found that to be unsubstantiated? Because obviously once uh, the suspect's body was found, uh, and all clear was given on the campus, so can you just give us an idea of how that was found to be unsubstantiated? Yes, through in our interviews with uh, the shooter's father, uh, we brought that up to him, and he had mentioned that his son does not have any friends and pretty much sat in his room most of the time. He ate, um, went to the bathroom in there. So he, he pretty much never left his room, and his father didn't believe that he had any friends, let alone 20 of them that would, would help him put this out. So we kind of determined that he was the one shooter in this. And is all of that done before the all clear is given on campus? Yes. Well, actually, yes, that's something I'd have to let Deputy Chief Rosman answer to as far as when the all clear was given, but just what we did with our investigation on that. So then just if you can just follow up on that, obviously a lot of students, a lot of families were going to be learning about these revelations. Uh, can you, what can you tell us about the timeline of getting those claims, disproving them, and where alerting families are going to get that it was all clear? Sure. And I would point out that it's, it's easy to, in hindsight, look at this was happening very rapidly. What I will say is, at the, at the time that that information was received, that the note was found in his pocket, we had already established, established not only a unified command post in the field, but we had activated our emergency operations center, and information was being shared live time between uh, the unified command post, our emergency operations center, uh, operating under our incident command system. And so that's the reason that we were able to get information so quick from the scene where the shooter was found, in his pocket, and relay that information live time to the people uh, like myself that were making decisions on what information was accurate to communicate with the public. And you know, at the time, we had to make a decision whether we believe that the, the statement about there being 20 people involved was credible based on the information that we had at the time, and I stand by that, and we continue to stand by that, we do not believe that to be accurate, and that's why we did what we did. So thank you for the question. I'm gonna go somewhere. But I just want to clarify on, on the timeline on this. The tweet, so I just want to be clear, your department put out a tweet at 12.28 a.m. <coughs> saying there is no longer a threat to campus. So at that time, when that tweet is put out, your department has already been made aware of the claim of 20 other shoes and has already disproved or looked into that. We had already received uh, information from the scene, very detailed information from the scene, and we processed that information and made that decision. Yes, that's the answer. Yeah. Can we uh, hold, hold, hold on, hold on. Uh, in the back, right there, please tell uh, Yeah, a uh, quick question for Chief Sosby and the President. Uh, Chief Sosby, will you be releasing the body camera video from the Larch and Cedar Street, like half of the previous investigations that are going on? When we are involved in a situation like this, we, our policy and procedure is to release the video. However, this investigation is being conducted by the Michigan State Police and Campus Police, so we'll leave that determination up to them as to when that I mean, so you've done it with a couple officers involved shootings while state police are still doing their investigation. Yes, that's true, and in, in, in cases that we do do that, we are in full cooperation with the investigating agencies in this case. And then for the president, real quick, um, Berkeley Hall is closed for the rest of the semester. The union is closed for now. What happens after that? Are you going to go through a remodel like um, Oxford did? Or are they going to be completely torn down and rebuilt uh, like Sandy Hook? Or what's the process for that? Our leadership group is meeting, and uh, we're making determinations of the disposition of each of the buildings uh, in, uh, in real time. So I don't have an answer for that. Well. Question for Chief, Chief Lynch. Lynch. David. I know there's a lot of questions. We're going to do our best to get to all of them. So in the back, on the seat back. Um, I'm sorry, I was too tired. Yeah, yeah. yep, we got it. Uh, any reaction on the fact that Craig, because of that plea deal in 2019 in the Lansing case, was able to purchase these two handguns? And to follow up on that, uh, we were going around that uh, he had been turned down for a job at MSU, and that could have been a possible motive. I'll adjust the second question first, and I'll see if anybody wants to, to take the first. Um, that is part of the investigation in terms of his connection to MSU. We can find uh, no connection to MSU at this time. He was not a current uh, student faculty staff or a former student faculty staff. Um, we are aware of that claim as well. We are investigating it, um, and I don't have an answer for you right now, but it will be uh, reviewed as part of our investigation. 
I will address the charge sheet prepared for that question. You guys get into it. Yes, sir. Right. In reaction to the fact that the 2019 case, the group uh, that our panel was put down by the then prosecutor, the way it was put down allowed him to buy these two handguns Yes, my understanding is that the in that case a, a motion was made by the defense, uh, and then, then before that motion was pushed through to a decision that the prosecutor then the prosecutor of the county chose to uh, drop that charge and negotiate down to a lesser uh, crime, which gave him no jail time, no felony charge for him, him buying additional weapons in the future, and a year of probation. But that that, that prosecutor is no longer in the county. Can you confirm that they allowed? Or maybe the prosecutor has some more hindsight to how the plea deals are happening all the time. We would all hope that the, a prosecutor would, would uh, uphold the, the law as it's written. Um, there is always room for uh, some type of discrepancy or, or discretion. Uh, however, um, that one uh, will be under scrutinized for, for a long time, I'm sure. Do we know that he bought the gun? I thought you guys just said purchase legally. Can you confirm that? He did purchase the gun legally. He was allowed to purchase the, the gun. There was nothing in place to prohibit him from purchasing a, a fire uh, ready to go. Uh, the, when New Jersey police put out the, the statement about the school closures, they indicated that um, Mr. McRae had a history of mental health issues. Are you guys looking into that? What, what have you discovered so far? I think that's something that obviously we're going to look at. Obviously, you know, uh, in hindsight, judging what um, mental illness somebody has is very difficult without some type of formal diagnosis. Um, obviously, in this case, there appears to be indications that that may be the case. Um, it's going to be difficult to, to confirm that. But I think that's the, a question that we have as well is, did, is uh, if he did have any mental illness, and did it play into this particular incident? And we'll be looking at that uh, comprehensively as part of our investigation. Can you share uh, possibly how close you are to Matt's motive? Anything about Matt's motive that you can share with us? Yeah, again, like Lieutenant Gonzalez said, you know, that's a difficult question. We've said that from the beginning. Um, it, it appears, based on the content of the note, that he felt that he was slighted in some way by people or businesses. Um, did a mental health issue have amplified that or was it a component of that? We're not sure at this point. Um, I just want to assure everybody that that's the, the question on all of our minds. Um, and we're working our best to, to try to determine that as best as possible. And we've committed to sharing accurate information and I don't have an accurate answer for you right now other than to say that we continue to look at that and um, attempt to determine the actual motive. And was he a member of the church? I don't have that information. So, all right. Yeah, for Chief, for Chief Lynch. Um, police reported a lot of misinformation and false reports coming in Monday night. Uh, some of that information was broadcast on Scanner, which we know a lot of students were listening to in real time. Do you think that contributed to the panic on campus? Well, Stephen, um, misinformation, misinformation is, you know, it's self-defined by how it's stated, right? And, um, if that's what's going on, um, what else do you have to believe if you're listening, actively listening to a scanner? And that's why we were communicating in the manner that we were. Please utilize us as your source for information. Uh, so related to that, there's a couple points that uh, police put out reports that turned out to be false. So uh, of a shooting at IM East or um, of someone actively shooting as late as 11.30 p.m. Did those false reports you were getting make your job more difficult? And how did you determine what to put out on Twitter or send out an alert? So those were reports received through dispatch that is then coming to uh, to us. Uh, the way that the, uh, the the coordinated operation, how we set up, is that there were teams assigned to buildings, and then we had response teams that were set up to respond to calls. Um, we operate on trying to verify and go from there. And so when we received calls like that, if that's what you hear on the scanner and that's how we're being dispatched, we're sending officers to that location. Those officers get there, they get to IMEs, no signs of shooting, not hearing anything. That's the response. But so how is it decided to put something out on Twitter or make an alert? 
Well, it's, we know that, that there is a scanner that people may be accessing. And so when we have the opportunity to uh, verify or to confirm that it's not true, then we do that. That's part of the overall decision-making process with that. What is the value of doing that at that particular time? As they're putting out 1130, that they just felt like uh, someone had to be shooting with what Matt said. Can you talk about the decision-making for that? One? It would have been based on what information that was used at that time to have that decision. With that. It's all it's all real time. It's very nimble yeah. with that, and that's why we should be the source of information. The professor who led the classroom where the shooting started in Berkeley Hall said that there was no way that he would lock the classroom from the inside. Um, is that the case in classrooms across campus? Um, and is that best practice um, to, to not have a locking mechanism? Most, most K twelve schools, for instance. In these instances, we have a mechanism for teachers to lock the classroom doors. Well, that, yeah, that's the familiar with the statistical information for K 12, but would be the fact is that we have 400 buildings as opposed to maybe one or six with that. So the sizes are definitely going to vary with that. Um, our practice currently is to not outfit each and every classroom with mechanisms like that. Uh, there are a couple of reasons why or why not to. That's in the discussion in itself on the advantages, the pros, and cons with that. Um, however, you know, those components, these coming days and discussions we're going to have in our community is to, we're not going, we'll lead the discussions, but we'll present options. And as a community, we'll decide on how we proceed with different physical security, um, police officer presence, potentially security officer presence, additional security systems. All of those will become part of it with that. But uh, today, that is, that is not how we're set up in all of our classrooms with that. Uh, you mentioned that students rendered aid to each other. So we are hearing reports that possibly one of the students carried, acted heroically, and, and, and tried to take the, the shooter down. Um, can, can you verify those, those reports? I know it is still very early in the investigation. I couldn't speak specifically to that action with that. No, we, lots of information um, being fielded at this time. What I shared at the beginning of this press conference was what was shared directly with me um, by individuals involved with that. Um, I would, again, wouldn't be surprised if that were the case, but at this time, I just couldn't confirm that that actually took place. And then a, a very quick follow-up. Um, I, I know that you mentioned you were not going to be identifying the five students who are still in the hospital. Are you able to confirm that two of them are uh, exchange students from China? Is that something that you can speak to? No. No, not, not at this particular time. We do know that there are, we do have some international students, but couldn't confirm, confirm at this time uh, where their home country is. Let's go in the back still, or on the left. I uh, just wanted to say this for MSP. You said that you were able to complete his journey from campus to the site where he was shot himself. He had all this ammunition that kind of leads you to believe he had plans to do more. I mean, was there, could you, was there any point in there where did he seem in a hurry? Or did he stop at other places and kind of contemplate doing something? Or was he calmly walking home? It looked like from, from looking at the video that we did have portions of that he was just walking home. Uh, where he, his uh, ending spot at Lake Langton Large was just around the corner from his house on House, on House Street. Uh, so it, it appears that he was just heading home. Was the church or the warehouse anywhere in the area? Like, did it seem like that was the no, it, it appeared to to us that he was he was heading home when someone just spotted him from the, uh, from the picture we put out on. Neighbors have said that they called the cops about hearing shootings at the father's house. Were those not responded to? Or? If you don't mind, is everybody okay if I call the people? Is that okay? I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. It's okay. I'll come back. To you. Um, uh, right here, the man in the black vest. Yeah, I have a question for the president. Um, what do you have to say to students and future students who say that this shooting, um, the university is tarnished by this shooting? Uh, I believe we are a strong community, and uh, we will not allow a single uh, individual to take our university from us. Uh, and we uh, heard that loud and clear from many of our students. We are still processing that this is our home, this is our university. Uh, project. Were the uh, two handguns purchased after the arrest in 2019? And do you know, or can you clarify where they're purchased? I don't know if we have that information. I don't think we're prepared with that information right now. Um, we may be able to share that in the future. We just don't have it right now. 
in the back. Good. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, just multiple neighbors have said that they did call the police about issues of hearing gunshots at the father's house, or that was not responded to, or that the neighbors not accurate on that. But the information we have is that those are not accurate. We checked all our call logs along with our dispatch logs, and we did not receive a license but has not received any calls for shots fired at that residence. Thank you for the present. I talked to two students who have been distributing a petition with about 11,000 signatures for some sort of Zoom or online option. That's a semester. It's similar to what's offered at Oxford High School. Has there been a discussion of that in the administration? Yes, we've discussed that, and there's ongoing discussion. Do you see that as a possibility for students? We're, we're considering all options uh, for the manner in which uh, we continue the continuity of education, research, and outreach on this campus. Has there been talk of differentiating for students with classes in the Union and Berkey or who are in those classes? options different for them for the rest of the student body or would whatever solution sort of be applied to them? Yes, we've been talking about places and spaces and uh, where education will continue. Um, and uh, certain of those two buildings are central to some of those conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's been a lot of details today about you know, what was in the note. Can you just clear up you know, what exactly was in the note? Uh, I know it was mentioned earlier about a possible why. You know, can you say what, what possibly you know about the motive to this point? So again, I, I really do think we've said all we can about what we think the motive might be. Um, I, I commend and appreciate the Michigan State Police sharing as much information as they have about that note. Um, I, I really think that's all we have to share at this point. We'll continue to evaluate that note from a lot of different angles, uh, a lot of investigative avenues. Um, if we determine anything else, uh, if that note is of any additional value, uh, we may share some more information in the future. Uh, but as of today, I think we shared what we can in terms of the content that we hold. Let's do one more question. Um, right there. Go ahead, that's your time. Yes, this is for you. I do want to practice that. We do want to share those stories of students and officers that are me. But the Chief Deputy Chief Frostman previously mentioned that there was an overwhelming police response. So I need to ask when the right, uh, the grant was able to exit the end of the MSU get out of the campus and then we found it in the city of Lansing, almost four hours away. Uh, when we talk about this massive police response, how is this not something else now, especially if it sounds like he was walking? Yeah, definitely. You know, it, it, like we talked about already today, um, the, the chaos that, that ensued and the, uh, the information that we were receiving, um, due to the number of reports that we were receiving on campus, um, we actually, at the time, thought that he was still on campus. I mean, we had no indication at the time that he left campus. Um, we were receiving and responding to so many calls about potential shots fired or sightings of this person um, on campus. Although we deployed resources off campus, we didn't receive any calls. We didn't receive any calls, whether they be uh, valid or not, off campus as additional law enforcement resources arrived from all over the state of Michigan, um, from counties away, we started to deploy those resources out, uh, almost if you picture kind of a ring. So if there's our incident, we kind of have our inner, and then we kind of work our way out in different rings. That's how we started deploying our resources. We started with campus. Um, our goal at the time was to ensure the absolute safety of every student and every person on this campus after the shooting. And that's where most of the calls were coming from, and that's what we were really focused on. Uh, we had no indication at the time to believe that he was off campus, and especially that far off campus, um, two, three, four miles. So working through our unified command post, um, as resources responded, we started deploying them out further. And when that call did come in, uh, due to that decision, we had resources that were able to quickly respond to that, that location. Um, I know it's something that, uh, in hindsight, can kind of be questioned, how did he get from, from point A to point B um, with nobody seeing him or no law enforcement seeing him? And all, all I can do is assure you and the community and our, our uh, students that we were acting on the best information we had at the time, making uh, critical decisions that, that we still stand by, 
uh, in deploying our resources in the most efficient and effective way possible to ensure the continued safety of campus, which we, which we did. So even though the calls came out of Turkey and even which is west, there was never a surrounding of these buildings where these calls were coming out of. Do you believe, it sounds like you're saying there was just a sense of hysteria, it's possible it could have just slipped away. Yeah, and I, you know, I'll, I'll compare it to the, the Open Miss High School shooting for a situation, uh, the hoax situation. When that happened, we all thought that was real. Um, when the additional calls came in that there were additional shooting scenes on campus, we thought those were real initially. We responded like they were real. We reacted like they were real. We sent tactical teams and, and inserted ourselves into those buildings and our officers, following their, their training uh, and their drive, uh, entered those facilities ready to hunt somebody down and take them out and prevent them from uh, any, uh, any other life. And that's what we did. It took us a while to determine that some of those were, were false, were hoax uh, calls. So as we were working through that information, we were actively responding to those, um, those scenes uh, and deploying our resources. Um, and you know, it, it it took us a while to determine. You, you heard it, everybody here. It sounds like was listening to the scanner. I mean, we were listening to the same thing. A lot of a lot of those calls sounded real when they went out. We thought they were real, and we responded like they were real, and we were ready to to, to um, do what we're trained to do. So I do want to say that I think that we all have a lot of questions, particularly me. My daughter was, I was getting live updates about what was happening in real time. And transparency is one of the um, priorities of the, the board. So as as new information comes, I'm expecting fully that we'll all be apprised. I do want to add one update. Um, Sparrow um, has called and let us know that one of our students has moved from critical to stable condition. So I do want to continue to pray for those families um, pray for the families who will be having services over the next couple of days for their students who have, um, have not made it. They sent their, their students to, to Michigan State for a quality, world class education, and now they are, um, they're, they're holding services. So just hold the, a space for them in your hearts and continue to, to wish the best for those who are still struggling. That, was the good news that we have at least one who has improved. Thank you. Thank you.